So hello everyone and welcome to this exclusive interview. I am Ritu Parna and I am a member of the advisory board of Movement and Mobility Group, which is an organization dedicated to bridging the gap between mobility, social sciences and humanities. Today we have the privilege of speaking with Mr. Justin Hayat and the esteemed advisor to the Car Free Cities Alliance, a platform where he works very dedicatedly for the, uh, for the development of car free cities. He has been associated with this organization for a pretty long time and we are really glad today to have him in this conversation with us. We will deep dive into this world of sustainable urban mobility, car free cities and the innovative solution, solutions the organization has been promoting for such a long time. Our goal today is to Mr. is to our goal today is to gain the most out of his experiences so that every one of us we can also participate in and we can get some more exclusive exclusive knowledge of what is happening across the globe. So before I begin, I would also like to extend my heartfelt thanks to Dr. John and Dr. Nathan. He is not here because of some uh, prior commitments, but I hope we can just have a wonderful discussion and so that we can carry on this discussion in the long run as well. So thank you, Mr. Justin, for having, for giving us the time for this interview, for this conversation. So to begin with, uh, I was just going through the organization, the main motives, the manifestos and everything. So how did this come by? So when did it start and how did it come by? So how is it going? Thank you. So. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ritaparna Das. I'm happy to be here and happy to speak with you today and answer your questions and provide any insights that I can. Uh, so to ask to answer your first question, how did we come about as an organization? Uh, I'll give you a very brief uh, history, which uh, basically includes the fact that prior to the Car Free Cities Alliance, there was another organization uh, called World Car Free Network. And the World Car Free Network started, uh, I believe, in 1997 and was mainly active in the years between the year uh, 2000 and 2010. And I became active with that organization during the period that it was uh, that it was working. Uh, it was based, for the most part, in Prague in the Czech Republic. And it was closely working with member organizations in Europe, uh, North America, as well as other uh, parts, other regions of the world, uh, although most of the uh, members were in Europe and North America. So after the organization stopped being uh, active, uh, many of us still uh, were around and were interested in maintaining uh, some, some sort of uh, work in the area. And so myself and one of the members of the organization, actually based in uh, Dhaka in Bangladesh, uh, that would be uh, Deborah F. Frimson. So we decided, uh, with a small group of people, we decided to revive the work of the organization. And instead of just continuing with the same name and in the same vein, we decided to start a new organization yet uh, based on the legacy of what had been done with the World Car Free Network. And so that's how the Car Free Cities Alliance was born. And that would date back to around 2018 um, with lots of discussion and um, sort of preparatory work going into that. And uh, one thing to mention from the start is that we were very keen on having this alliance more broadly speaking to and including uh, different regions of the world, so not just Europe and North America, but also the the, the whole world approach. So we have, uh, to, um, to this day, we have a lot of members and active uh, groups in Asia, as well as in Africa. We have some in uh, South America. And then, of course, we also have a presence in Europe and partners in North America as well. So uh, we take it upon ourselves to be a global organization that works quite closely with a lot of local members. And um, that would be the brief history of the organization. 
Uh, do you want me to jump into the objectives or how would you like me to continue? Okay, so it's very interesting that you have this uh, pan global representation in your organization. You have a presentation from like countries like Bangladesh and uh, I think you have from India as well. I did see if you have um, your organization Bangalore, if I'm not wrong. So a uh, part of it, you have a project which is there in Bangalore, India as well. Um, short work mm -hmm. which is so, there in Bangalore as well. Sure. So, uh, so how do you think like uh, the global north and the global south, they perceive car-free cities as since you have network all over the world. So you have a broader overview, it's a, bit, a better comparison, I will say, because in case of global south, the car, the mentality of owning a car is very different from what it is in the global north, like in US or the Europe. So how do you perceive it? So how does your organization, they represent their thoughts? Sure, sure. So uh, personally, my belief is that a lot of issues and a lot of the dynamics surrounding mobility, surrounding car culture, uh, while there are uh, very important differences, if we're talking about the global south or the global north, uh, there there are huge differences, and you know, each of these regions are in different stages of development and have their own specific problems. Yet, I do also believe that a lot of the the problems and a lot of the dynam dynamics surrounding car culture is actually quite similar, and a lot of the ways that things function in an urban mobility situation is also, uh, well, comparable at least. So uh, I wouldn't want to just divide up the world into like completely different systems because I think that while, yeah, while we do need to look at exactly what are the local circumstances and situations, uh, many things are still the same. So, I mean, just for example, um, the, the issues surrounding uh, the negative externalities surrounding driving and uh, let's say lots of driving, gridlock, traffic jams, uh, car crashes, um, uh, tr uh, transport poverty. So a lot of these things are similar yeah, or, or are existing in places yeah. like, uh, like India or in Bangladesh, but then they're also present in Europe and in North America. Uh, and when people have the opportunity to reach out for alternatives and, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, for example, uh, cycling is over the last decade and more has become uh, very exciting for a lot of people. There are a lot of organizations that promote cycling. And I mean, just as an example, that that's just as valid in Europe as it is in Asia or Africa. So uh, I do think that we have to look carefully at what, the, what are the differences, but I think uh, we can see ourselves as a global network that uh, addresses similar concerns and problems and situations while also providing a certain uh, level of uh, a positive alternative and a level of hope and uh, useful tools and ideas that can also, that can also be used anywhere. Yes, that was pretty informative. And I also personally believe that region-wise also, as a, uh, we all know, the policies, the government which they have devised, they also differ a lot from one region to the other. So naturally, the ownership pattern, I'll say, and in fact, the, our thinking process is changing always. Like, uh, as I can say, in case of India, what happens, we, uh, we have often seen people, the aspirers, people who are relatively from economically weaker section, they aspire to have two wheelers. They don't aspire to have a four wheeler right in the beginning. So what is your take on that? Like, um, is a two, owning a motorized two wheeler can be a good alternative for a car free city? Okay, uh, so the aspiration to own a car or a, a two wheeler even. So I think that's also something similar to what I just said. Uh, we can find these aspirations in many places. I, I've been to countless places, whether in Europe or in Asia, where people say, yeah, here people love driving and uh, it's kind of built into our DNA that people love to have cars and to drive and stuff like that. And so uh, actually, if you can say that, that about any place, then <laughs> it's not really something specific to that place, is it? So it's actually uh, a lot of places where people aspire to have, uh, to have car 
And a part of it uh, really goes back to, I think, um, what I would say an unfortunate uh, export from the, um, like, let's say from North America about the car equating, uh, having a car with freedom and uh, this like rugged individualism idea and also the whole world of advertising showing cars to be this thing that liberates you. Um, well, however, if you stop somebody in uh, uh, very dense gridlock, just ask them if they're really liberated by sitting in a car when they can't move. But uh, so I think that there has been this idea that a car is something to aspire to. And that is definitely present in lots of countries around the world. Now, I would say that there are a number of countries where this is slowly changing and where it's not, especially among the younger, at least in, in Europe, uh, among the younger generation in countries like, say, the Netherlands or Scandinavia, Switzerland, for example. So I think that for a lot of young people, the car is no longer the same status symbol that it might have once been. Uh, I think uh, that's slowly changing and people are more aware, people are aware of the climate and climate change, people are aware of their own health and people, uh, I think a lot of people can understand that cycling and walking, these are very good for your health and very important to do. Now, to your question, if a two-wheeler, so I understand that to be, a, let's say, motorized, like a motorcycle or a motorbike or something, if that would be a step um, by circumventing the car and then using that instead. Um, I'm personally a little bit skeptical of that because I think that two-wheelers themselves, if you look at the uh, number of factors, if you look at, um, let's say, the, the safety issues involved, I think that they're definitely, that can be dangerous, that they're not safe for people uh, uh, drive, drive, driving them. Um, I think that... Um, yeah, for the for the uh, fuels used, that's still there. Um, uh, there aren't really any health benefits to it, and whether or not that leads somebody to, to then switch to the bicycle, for example, I'm not totally um, sure about that. Um, it's also a very large noise factor. So I remember when I was in India um, the first time, that was in 2018, and. Um, I remember in the main cities that I visited, just the the din and the the loud uh, uh, kind of the loud background noise that I had everywhere I went, attributed to well cars, but then also to a lot of two wheelers. And then uh, it was actually interesting when I went to Bangladesh and the neighborhood that I stayed in, uh, where I was there for that week, uh, happened to be a very walkable and almost car free neighborhood. And so the difference in the noise was from just tons of background noise to actually hardly any motorized sounds at all. Like if a car happened to pass through the neighborhood, it was like, oh, okay, yeah, there's a car passing through. But it wasn't this ongoing din and background noise. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I do think that um, that most places can very feasibly function in terms of uh, walking and cycling uh, to get most to get to most des destinations. You can get quite far. Uh, with a bicycle, and if you have uh, public transport for all cases, uh, otherwise, I think that that's fairly doable. So I think more than a technical question, I think it's a question of culture. It's a question of what people are used to. Uh, it's a question of social change, uh, of willingness, uh, maybe also to try new things out. So there's a lot of things which we can talk about in terms of how can we shift the culture to embrace more of a sustainable mobility paradigm, which includes uh, highly uh, emphasizing the, the walking, the cycling, and the public transport. So how can we work to shift the culture surrounding mobility? Um, because the technical, let's say, foundations are pretty much there. So uh, doing the right thing is actually, it, it's, it's not uh, rocket science. We can do the right things we can re-engineer our cities to work in much more sustainable ways. Uh, all of that is really uh, graspable. So it's all doable. So I think what the kind of conversations which we need to be having are the social ones, the political ones, the personal ones, uh, also just uh, addressing people's concerns, people's needs, 
and making sure that people are also comfortable in a shift to a more sustainable, environmentally friendly city, neighborhood, and so forth. Right. So as you have mentioning that it's all about the culture of the place and uh, also the public perception is what is important. So what do you think, what are the major challenges in terms of public perception of the policy adoption? Like you have worked across so many places globally. So you have a better knowledge, like what sort of public perception is there when it comes to a country like Bangladesh, Africa, in, Af in countries in Africa and in Bangladesh and in India. And obviously the, per uh, the perception in Europe and US will also be different. So how do you think, like what are the major challenges? Um, is there, what are the major challenges in terms of public perception and policy adoption? Okay, and sure. So I, I would say that in the, in the public perception, I think often, uh, the public has a fairly good knowledge and understanding of situations, but I think what's often missing is just to make that that like last connection, the the last sort of putting the different pieces together to really uh, like under you know. So for example, a lot of people uh, who are trapped in gridlock or who spend a lot of time in their car driving, they realize and I think they have the, they have the innate sense that it, it's it's not a perfect solution. It's, it's not a good situation. It needs to be addressed. Uh, it could be a lot better. Uh, I think a lot of people realize uh, probably deep down inside them that, that somehow the system isn't really working for them. Maybe they have to travel one or two hours each direction a day to get to work or to go where they need to go. And they might be frustrated if they're stuck in a lot of traffic. They, I mean, they might be so used to it. So they're used to the honking horns used to all the noise, used to the pollution that they almost don't even think about it because they're so used to it. But still, I think people uh, do, uh, you know, when, when press at least, they do understand that there are a lot of problematics with that situation. And of course, those who uh, unfortunately and sadly have either lost loved ones or know of people who have been uh, either injured or whatever it might be. So uh, I think that, that there is a lot of knowledge of the problems with the way that mobility is uh, done in lots of cities around the world. But I think that the extra step which is needed in the perception is just to realize what the, what situations could actually be. Because it's a very normal thing for us as humans to see what there is around us and to be a bit stuck in terms of not being able to imagine how it could be different from that. So you see something every day, you have a hard time, like, you know, let's say you see in front of your house, a busy road, lots of traffic going by. It's it's really difficult to imagine, oh, this could actually be a beautiful space with lots of trees and people cycling paths. You know, it's just, it's that extra step in the imagination to realize that it could be a different scenario. It could be a different situation. Uh, that people don't often go there in their kind of mental understanding of of a possible future. So people don't go there and therefore they have the feeling like, okay, well, we're more or less stuck with this or they might think of some, I would call them false solutions like building flyovers or, you know, just kind of increasing all of the, exponentially increasing all of the kind of car infrastructure which even if you do build flyovers, even if you do expand the roadways, it's always going to get stuck again because the more that you provide the space for people to uh, jump in their cars and travel even for short distances or whatever it might be, the more people use that. And so I think that, that part of the problem with uh, the public perception is, is really one that each of us can change if we're engaged in that area, if we have the opportunity to talk with uh, others, uh, to think about it, to be exposed to some of the good solutions. So I think that that um, people who have been, um, <clears throat> let's say, have had the chance to learn more, to like think, let's say, a few steps further, uh, would be able to realize that something like a car-free city or at least a, a, uh, a greatly um, reduced um, like tra uh, traffic and transport situation could actually be very beneficial for them. Uh, one example 
I can use some of my research that I did when I was yeah. uh, doing my master's at university uh, in New York. Uh, there was a boulevard in Queens, New York, uh, Queens Boulevard. And at the time they did the research back in the mid, uh, around 2015, um, there had been in that in that uh, corridor, there had been so many uh, crashes taking place. You know, a lot of people had, had died. In some instances, uh, children had been hit and had been killed. And for the people living there, it had become so obvious that this is a problem that when a local organization uh, went out and started working in the area, talking to people, getting, uh, you know, doing petitions, getting signatures, everybody was ready for the new thing. So uh, as soon as they were prodded with the idea that would you be happy to see something better, you know, put we can put in some bicycle lanes, you know, we can make uh, more uh, safety uh, precautions for pedestrians, we can change this, we can change that. So when they went out and they talked to people, people were quite receptive to that. And they they actually, they signed off on that, they wanted to do that. And so this organization in coordination with the city was able to go in and uh, put in the uh, request and the des and new designs for that uh, corridor. And that was successful. So they, they went section by section, upgrading the street uh, or the boulevard, and they did make it a lot better. And as a result of that, it's safer. A lot of people's lives have been saved by that. Uh, people are able to move there as pedestrians or as cyclists in ways that they couldn't before. And so it's a situation that was able to go the, the next step because um, it, there was this engagement by local activists and they they did it very carefully and methodically. And then they talked to people and uh, they helped people basically stretch their imagination to understand and believe that it could be different. Um, because at the beginning, before they, they really got very far, people did say things like, oh, it will never, it'll never change. It'll always be that way. And I think that this way of thinking, it will never change. It's very endemic <laughs> in cities all over the world. People see, oh, it's really bad. Too bad. It's not going to get better. So what we're proposing is, is that if we have a lot of uh, people who who think like us, who have the similar vision to us, and if we're able to engage on a local level with people who, when uh, you know, when asked, uh, can actually agree that this is a situation that does need improvement, I think that that's a step towards actually getting further because the more people have the understanding of what the future could be like and can imagine those scenarios, the closer we can get to actually bringing those and implementing those. Yes, so basically the participatory action you're talking about, it's all comes within the community. So once we can actually involve the communities and we can inspire the communities to actually get into a car-free lifestyle, so maybe it will only help the people in the long run. And once they get adapted to that situation, maybe it will help them in the long run. Like life can be better. It's like putting, imbibing that thought inside that, okay, life can be good uh, without cars. So I think COVID was a pretty good example when there was so much of mobility restrictions and people were almost restricted. So there was a lot of community bonding also happening in the local neighborhoods, not just in India, it was happening in UK as well. So I think after COVID also many people, a lot of initiatives happened where parklets uh, and this concept was developed with local parking spaces were developed into small, small parks and the restaurants also, they converted the parking lots into small bicycle stands. And they even said that uh, they have more footfall especially the restaurants and everything, like just because they have shifted to a more non-motorized means of transport. So people are coming more because they feel it is always more welcoming to them. So definitely like it's all about the public participation, which is very important. And I think uh, there is uh, in UK also, they had this new concept of low uh, traffic neighborhood thing where they had few streets which were restricted to car movement. So what is your take on that? Like how far it has been successful? Because many people, many neighborhoods, what I read is they were completely fascinated by this and they did not want to revert back to the normal streets where there were cars and they always wanted to, uh, their neighbors to, their neighbors to stay that way. So what is your take on that? Like 
how has your place evolved or anything any sort of examples you have from your place well i i think i mean i agree with what you said i think you kind of um <laughs> actually you answered the question almost yourself so i mean i i uh, think you're you're quite right in that um i was in the netherlands during uh, covid or at least during the first part and some nice things that i saw during that time in the city uh, where i live in rotterdam they put a number of uh, designs into intersections just to make it easier for cyclists or for for walking um so they yeah they made it uh, like nicer they put um they put uh, picnic uh, tables out uh, in in public spaces so for example like just i mean for me personally where i live in the street that i lived uh whereas previously there wouldn't have been the place to do that i could actually take my own mug of coffee my book i could go downstairs i could go sit somewhere at a uh, on a on a bench at a like with a picnic table and i could sit and read or do whatever and that was actually a very nice amenity that had only been put in right. as a response to the covid situation and so uh in that way i could say i benefited directly from that and you could see you know of course they put the tables far enough apart from each other to you know allow for social distancing and all that but yeah that was a good example people used it people were, were happy with that people were able to be outside in safe places and do do their thing uh and so i think there was some responses like that and in other countries as well um and to be honest around that time in the early part of the covid pandemic so in early to mid 2020 uh there was this real sense of um uh, like the the silver lining um in the whole thing and you know the potential to be a game changer in terms of helping us to rethink a lot of ways how we do things and so I I remember a lot of people at the time were talking about okay so you know you know like in different cities uh, like in Milan and Italy and other places they talked about long term permanent changes to the cities to to really bring in um you know, let's say to increase cycling to a, a higher level and just a lot of different things uh so there was a lot of um I would say yeah, a lot of optimism at that moment even though it was a difficult time otherwise but there was optimism that that could help usher in a new situation and one thing also that i think people realize is that the whole mobilization in cities as a response uh, or in, not just cities but around the world in response to covid it also showed that people could uh take steps with quite some speed in terms of uh, being able to really um yeah being able to really uh, respond to the situation so i think i mean this is a longer discussion but i think that some of that optimism uh has since then been lost because it has become quite clear that a lot of um well uh, around the world i mean whoever we want to say is responsible for it, like a lot of parts of society or economy or whatever uh did try to come back to business as usual i would say that there are good um let's say legacies or continuations of some of the things that were started during that time some things have reverted but it's still a flux and we're still also quite early after that so it still is an opportunity uh and in some cases yeah i think a lot of interesting things that we could talk about um but at the same time one thing that we have to address is the fact that there is a a very let's say uh well financed industry which is uh behind the status quo so that means there are i mean you know car you know, from car companies to fossil fuel companies um and you know like whatever it might be cement uh industry so there's a lot of areas uh where there's just so much money involved in these industries and it's in their interest to perpetuate those practices that we as organizations or as just common people have a hard time uh doing something about that. Now, I think it's very important to say that um we are not helpless even though we're facing these kind of Goliath or uh companies with a lot more money than we'll ever see in our lifetime. So, it is important to say that we're not helpless and that's why organizing is so important and that's why working together is so important. That's why 
uh, coming to uh, shared visions of how we want to see the future is important because I think that we can make effective change, but at the same time, it is a slow process because of all of these, you know, very, let's say, well organized and well financed industries, which would like to basically perpetuate uh, these situations uh, of consuming fossil fuels, of endless driving, even though it has been seen that that is very unsustainable. Yes. So as you're saying that there's a huge car lobby, the fossil fuel lobby, who are actually behind this entire promotion of car-based initiatives and all these things. But along with it, one more interesting thing is about the in inclusivity and the equity part which comes into transportation. So how does Car Free City Alliance address the issues of accessibility for say underprivileged communities and people with disabilities? Because uh, usually when we're talking about people using cars, you might say that they use cars for long distance travel, but imagine a person who is not, who is not, who is differently abled, how can he or she or them actually benefit from the, how can they actually improve, get a better alternative if they want to access sure. something like car free? Mm -hmm. What are the next sure. best solutions so, here? Yeah, so first of all, uh, if we just take two different scenarios, one of a car dominant city and then one of a car free city, I think that we can see that somebody with disabilities or with uh, any kind of uh, Im impediments or whatever it might be, uh, in a car dominated city, they will be simply having a hard time getting around. They will not have great options. Let's say if it's somebody in a wheelchair, if it's somebody with walking disabilities, let's say um, seeing impairment, whatever it might, vision impairment, whatever it might be, um, somebody in a car dominated city will be put there, will, will be put out there basically facing a lot of the risks of um, really uh, like fast or uh, yeah, fast um, vehicles or, you know, potentially um, <laughs> vehicles with, with the potential to to uh, injure or to kill. So uh, it's, it's much more difficult, whereas in a car-free city, there is the space there to move around in different ways. And there is the space and every, every city and especially car-free cities in, in the way that we see them, they should be engineered in a way that everyone is catered to, that everyone... Um, can be taken care of well. I mean, there's the whole area of paratransit, which is, you know, specific kinds of transportation to help different needs. And that can be like a, like a bus on demand. It can be different sorts of like taxi or um, uh, sort of transport services. So there's a lot of different things. And in a car-free city where you don't have this very inefficient form of like millions of vehicles with single, uh, you know, single occupant vehicles, uh, you know, single person uh, in cars driving around, you have ways to organize things much more efficiently, which provides them the space for uh, other needs. And uh, the the other part of the inclusiveness and the, uh, the equity in designing these spaces is uh, through participation. So what we would like to have is ways for uh, local communities to be able to participate and to be there and present in the changes that happen there. So to be able to respond to, to be able to uh, um, uh, provide their opinions, to try things out, and uh, hopefully I'll have a chance to, to talk about that uh, later. Um, the, the, the very fact of trying things out is one of the most powerful ways of coming to see the benefits of something. So uh, that that should be its own uh, sort of special uh, um, topic, but um, in terms of uh, in terms of the involvement and the participation of people and able to have feedback loops within the system, I can give another. Uh, so I wanted to actually go back to the New York uh, Queens Boulevard um, uh, picture that I gave earlier. So one of the things that they uh, one of the ways that they do things uh, there in New York uh, is when they do a change, like they did successfully. Um, bring about these these uh, changes to the boulevard which i talked about so better conditions for cycling also you know walking uh, more safe and secure ways uh, at inter intersections and so forth so 
one of the approaches that they have there is that before they build the long term, the final design, before they put the final design into place, they have a short term uh, implementation, uh, what you could call a quick and dirty solution where they just get very like sort of cheap, um, uh, let's say, like materials, uh, like put them in place. So that you know and that they can set them up in the kind of in the way like a mock-up how it would be in the long-term version, but doable and workable already like the next day. Uh, that gives people a chance to try them out, to try out the new situation, to provide feedback, to provide responses, to get a feel for how that works, and then by the time that they put in the actual long-term infrastructure they've had this whole opportunity over a few months to understand how was it received by the population what are some uh, potential problems with it what are things that they need to like really make sure they do it properly and so this intermediate stage of having this kind of a temporary infrastructure that can be trialed and analyzed is actually i think one of the keys to making long-term infrastructure that really does uh, bring the best benefit to people. So, and that's all uh, including the participation of the community. Um, and that, and so that also fits into the, the idea of, um, yeah, equity and inclusiveness. So that's how I would answer that. And uh, I'm realizing that uh, the time on this call is about to run out. Yes. So actually, yes, when we are, whenever we are talking about planning and built environment thing, I always believe this environment psychology is definitely has a big role to play and people, the actual uh, stakeholders, they have a huge role. So thank you so much, Justin. And I just have one last question that is, if you can share a few experiences or the key takeaways based, uh, I'm asking you because you have already worked in so many countries like Tunisia, Hungary, and Netherlands. So what are the key takeaways from these international projects? Sure. Uh, there's, of course, a lot of great things that, that we could talk about for a longer period of time. But just to mention a few things, which are some, I'd say, very important inspirations. Uh, one of them from... Uh, Budapest from Hungary, where I lived for a fair amount of time uh, as a young adult. And I was lucky enough to be there at the time when uh, cycling and cycling activism uh, and critical mass bicycle rides became really uh, important. Uh, and this was in the middle of the 2000s. So between roughly starting around 2004 going forward, uh, there a, a uh, basically a massive uh, critical mass uh, movement of uh, cycling, uh, like cycling gatherings. Two times there would be uh, in Budapest twice a year. There would be really massive uh, bicycle rides, and uh, I was already involved with civil society at the time, so I was working together with a local Hungarian organization, and we were involved in those. So it was I was there, like right sort of at the very. Uh, place where things were happening. It was really exciting to see because I remember, I think it was in the year 2004 when it first started. I remember in the spring, there was a ride that had been organized with by, by just a small number of people, probably, I don't know, 40 people or just, yeah, not, not very many people. And well, I, it was standard uh, for the time. I mean, a lot of these demonstrations or rides, whatever, would always just get a handful of people. And uh, it just was what it was. That fall, there was another, there was a ride, a critical mass event organized. And I don't have a very, like, a good explanation for how it happened. But somehow there was an explosion of interest. And we had 4,000 people come and join. So it was a huge ride, 4,000 people. And then what happened was after that, every year, you know, two main rides a year, it just kept getting more and more. We had the next time 10,000 and 20,000. And like suddenly the whole world is talking about Budapest critical mass rides. I mean, there was like, I think the biggest ride had 100,000 participants, just like, you know, the whole city was flooded with cyclists. And my personal opinion, uh, part of the explanation is that I think people were really, so in a country where there has always been a lot of division between left and right and different parties and whatever. So I think that this was uh, something that people felt like, it, you know, because the, the organizers were very um, adamant to make sure that it was not like, could not be hijacked by any political 
like direction. So it was very much for everybody. And I think people really liked that. People liked the idea that this was something that anybody could be a part of. You know, it, it, it was, there were no political stripes to it. So it just became very popular and Budapest, like many other cities, you know, very car dominated without great cycling uh, conditions. And this whole uh, uh, interest and explosion in critical mass and in cycling and a lot of new cyclists would come. And in fact, it was seen, it was documented that with every ride, more everyday cyclists would be would come after that. So it's like basically a ride itself helped to bring about more everyday cyclists and the cycling culture developed. So uh, what happened after that was that uh, then the local governments had obviously you know, started taking notice. Well, maybe I shouldn't say obviously, uh, but they did start taking notice and they did start talking to the cycling community when there would be new infrastructure developed or let's say roads or bridges uh, 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 built so or or uh, or renovated. So now all of a sudden they would come to the cycling organizations. They would ask for input. They would talk with us. And so it was uh, something that wouldn't happen before. So I remember one comment. This was about adding bicycle lanes to a particular bridge, which was going to be renovated. And the discussion was and how wide and this and that. And somebody made the comment that a few years ago if the, the cycling community would have gone to the government and asked to put a cycling lane uh, on the bridge, they would have been, you know, laughed out of the room. And now they're actually a serious uh, partner and they're asked and there's discussions and so forth. So it really helped bring things forward and it really helped make uh, uh, the city uh, listen to the cycling community. And, and by that, you know, you, we could see, and, and we have seen a lot of new bicycle lanes emerge, a lot more cyclists on the road. And so uh, I would say my, the take home from that is that when you are able, and it, it's not something that, that just will happen everywhere as a miracle, like it somehow, it, you know, hard work is required, but when there are movements like that, that can get people ex, uh, ex, excited and inspired and can really um, attract a lot of the, the population, uh, then it has the chance to really like shift things in very uh, uh, very specific and very uh, tangible ways like it happened in Budapest. Uh, just very quick on the Tunisia side, um, taking some of that to Tunisia when I was there for a few years, um, myself and a few others, we started a local critical mass movement in the town that I was living in, Sous in Tunisia. And uh, on a much smaller scale, of course, uh, as a smaller city and just a kind of a different situation, that was also quite successful. A lot of young people loved getting a, being a part of this. And, and we did rides every month with, uh, with a, a small but uh, very um, energetic group of people. And yeah, people became a part of that. And so that was fun to be a part of. And while that might not have changed the city into a major cycling city overnight, it did show that working with people and especially bringing young people into this and getting, get, giving them something that to be excited about, uh, it worked and uh, people were there and people wanted to be a part of it. So yeah, that, I, I, I would say definitely tap into these kinds of situations where you can allow for, the, for, for people to help bring about the change themselves. So much Justin, for sharing your wonderful experiences and actually yes mobility is a people's movement so if people are willing then definitely we can come to a car free city and a solution so thank you so much justin for giving us your time and sharing your lovely very experience. welcome okay. definitely happy to do it all right thank you